is um, is childhood cancer month i mean and um, and we're very fortunate to have a very very eminent speaker with us and uh, right before we start i'm just going to, i'm wondering actually whether my colleagues are actually starting to record this uh, she is, she is already so uh, what is this uh, uh, so i'm i'm just going to ask you kindly um, if you have still got any of your uh, microphones on if you could mute it and subsequently uh, if you've got any videos on I, do, I don't see any that anyone's got a video on so that's lovely thank you very much uh, for kind of uh, aiding out with, with the ease in which we conduct the forum um, now um, I'm just gonna wait a, a few more minutes perhaps about a minute or two and uh, kind of then we'll kick off officially and then uh, I actually am quite excited to to get uh, Dr. Kogi to speak to us uh, this morning and, and share some of her insights uh, in, in this field. Um, uh, also, for those who are signing in for CME points, um, uh, a couple of things. First is, as you know, we'll give you uh, one code word halfway through uh, the session and one right, right at about the end of the session. And uh, uh, in addition to that, the video will actually be up a couple of minutes after the session ends on our YouTube page. And uh, we, you can still have about a week to view it and, and put in your uh, request uh, for CME points. And then we'll kind of process that to uh, the Medical Association. I think uh, the good thing out of COVID, one of the few good things is uh, a lot of people have been excused from getting their CME points. Don't know whether it's a good or bad thing, uh, but I think we start looking at um, the points for 2021. So this might be a helpful uh, avenue to obtain those points. So we're about one minute about, and so let me just kick this off. Uh, so first of all, ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you very much. Uh, this is Dr. Murali on behalf of the National Cancer Society of Malaysia. And uh, we are in the, the SK Dharma Lingam uh, lecture series. And uh, we cannot, uh, what is this, uh, stress enough how uh, appreciative we are to have you all with us this morning. And uh, I'm actually um, very honored to be able to welcome Dr. Kogilavani Gunasegaran, who is a pediatric hemato-oncologist with the Ministry of Health Malaysia. And uh, she's been kind enough to uh, come in this morning to speak to us and uh, share with us a little bit of insights about childhood cancer and kind of the Malaysian landscape pertaining to this. So um, just a little bit of, of um, um, kind of uh, background about Dr. Kogi. Uh, Dr. Kogi is, is of course a medical physician, she's a consultant. Uh, so she trained in the University of Malaya and uh, she's uh, currently attached to the Hospital Twanko Aziza, a hospital um, uh, otherwise known as the Women and Children's Hospital of Kuala Lumpur and um, among the other places that she has uh, kind of um, uh, worked in has been at the Children's Hospital at Westmead, Sydney, Australia, as well as in various institutions with the Ministry of Health Malaysia, including in Hospital Wan Mita in Kanakana Sabah for quite a bit. Uh, so, oh, so Dr. Kogi, uh, some thoughts on uh, how your colleagues are doing in Sabah with this COVID-19 issue. Hope they're all staying safe. Uh, yeah, I hope so. Yep, yep. Uh, I hope equally as well that patient care uh, doesn't take a hit due to this. Uh, I hope that patients from, especially from the interior parts of the state are still able to come out to kind of come and get uh, treatment and follow their regular appointments, especially in, in Likas. So uh, let's, let's hoping this gets on. So uh, this morning, ladies and gentlemen, in, in line with um, uh, this month being Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, we've, we've invited Dr. Kogi to speak to us about childhood cancer. And especially since the series has a little bit of a slant towards primary care, because um, really it's critical for us who are in the primary and secondary kind of management of uh, care clinically to kind of see and ascertain and kind of triage through picking up perhaps uh, early uh, some of the cases of childhood cancer which, which uh, pass through us. So, and, and in order to enlighten us on this field is, is going to be Dr. Kogi. So I'm just going to kind of let Dr. Kogi swing into it 
and uh, perhaps right after the first kind of sub session, we'll have we can take some, some questions. Feel free to type your messages into the chat box, and then we'll we'll put them up to Dr. Kogi to answer, and then we'll go into the second part of the session. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please let me turn this over to Dr. Kogi. Dr. It's all yours. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Dr. Murali. I would like to thank the National Cancer Society for inviting me to give a talk on the uh, topic of uh, children with cancer. As we know, or maybe some of you are not aware, but uh, I would like to uh, inform that September is our Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, so I would like to say thank you to the National Cancer Society for having me to say something about childhood cancer in Malaysia. So to begin with, let me just give a screenshot of what's happening and what is childhood cancer. So if you look at a nation, if you look at our whole world, uh, every three minutes a child is diagnosed with cancer. So everyone will be asking how, how common is cancer among children we, we have. Some of you have seen, some have not. So many of you will be wondering how, how common is this. So worldwide is um, every three minutes one child is diagnosed with cancer. How about in Malaysia? In Malaysia, we are seeing about 700 children uh, a year diagnosed with various cancers. And they are treated all over Malaysia in uh, different centers in private and also in the government and university. And if you want to talk about childhood cancer, they are very different to adult cancer. Yeah, and it doesn't discriminate. So why we have to consider childhood cancer different than adult cancer. Firstly, we know that childhood cancer is not related to lifestyle or environmental risk factor. So we, we will not be talking about quit smoking, tobacco and all those things. Childhood cancers are often due to DNA changes that takes place in the cells, sometimes in utero. So we have kids who are born with leukemia. So we have kids born with neuroblastoma and all that. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's different. So screening and early diagnosis is possible for many adult cancers and we are actually looking at how to, to have a successful screening program for adults. But it's very different in children. There's no, um, no tool to, to, to screen except for one or two cancers. And this is also important to emphasize yeah, that children tolerate chemotherapy far better than adults. So if you look at adults and how they go through the, the chemotherapy, many, many of the parents who see this picture straight away have this mental block and they think, oh, if adults take it this badly, how will my kid take this treatment? But I, I would like to stress that children tolerate chemotherapy far better than adults. However, because of their, because of their, they're still immature, we need to monitor them. Yeah, so we should not compare apple to an orange. So adult cancer is not the same as childhood cancer. Okay, so going to where are the places that we treat children with cancer. So this is just a, it's a snapshot of what's happening in Malaysia. Yeah? So if we look at our, our uh, population. So this is in 2010. So looking at our population, we look at a lot of, a lot of them are concentrated in Klang Valley. Then we have Sabah Sarawak. So we look at our centers. The yellow ones are all the government centers. The green is the private. And we have uh, three universities. Yeah, so mainly in Klang Valley will be our Women and Children Hospital, or now is known as Hospital Tunku Aziza. Then we have the universities, University Malaya, and also University UKM. And we have private centers. We have Subang Jaya Medical Center, Sunway. Yeah, these are the two medical centers that treat kids with cancer. So out of 
this Klang Valley, from north, we have uh, Penang Hospital, then Ipoh, then goes to JB, and Kuala Terengganu, and in Kelantan, we have Kubang Korean that is under USM. And we have one center in Sabah that is uh, Women and Children Hospital in Likas and Hospital Umum Kuching. Yeah, and we have a private center in Kuching that treats children with cancer. So if you look at how we treat children with cancer, it is a, it's a multidisciplinary team that needs to, in, to be involved. So we have these teams, these are our partners that we rely heavily upon. So the surgeons, all the surgeons, neurosurgeons, pediatric surgeons, ENT, ophthalmologists, plastic surgeons, we need to have a good blood bank services to support all our patients with leukemia. We need to have a pharmacies and all this that I have uh, mentioned. So we also rely very heavily on the pathology because the diagnosis is so important, yeah? And the radiotherapies. So we don't deliver the radiotherapies. We refer them to our our colleagues in the oncology department in adult services for this radiotherapy uh, treatment. So looking at the incident, we look at the breakdown of the common cancers that we see in Malaysia. So we have compiled from this uh, period of time and from these centers. So we can see that the most common cancer among the children in, in Malaysia, the first one is leukemia followed by brain tumor and lymphoma. So this is the top three cases, and we see about 700 new cases per year. So looking at the centers, if you look at the centers, so HKL is now, is Women and Children's Hospital, and then now renamed as Hospital Tunku Aziza. So we see about, about a, a quarter of the patients followed by UMMC, and this is the breakdown of each center. So if you look at Klang Valley, Klang Valley itself, we are seeing close to half of the patients. Yeah. This is, this is a, a, formal, um, a formal report or a document released by the Ministry of Health, uh, looking at the incidence of childhood cancer. So I've just taken the infographic and sharing with you. So this is from year 2007 to 2011. So looking at this info, the, the 10 most common cancers in childhood by the age group. So this is zero to 14 and 15 to 19. So we can consider this group as young adults, yeah. Okay, so the first one is leukemia, followed by brain and lymphoma. In the adolescents, leukemia, lymphoma, bone tumors. Yeah. And if we combine the whole group, zero to 19 years old, leukemia is still the most common cancer in the childhood, followed by lymphoma and brain. So, so if you look at it, leukemia, lymphoma, brain, or leukemia, brain tumors, and lymphoma, these are this this is the top three cancers in this age group. So if you divide them and look into the sex or gender, leukemia among the girls and the boys is still the most common. Then second followed by the brain tumors and lymphoma. Okay. When we zoom into the leukemias, looking at the age group for both girls and the boys, we see the most common age group leukemia happens is zero to four, and it slowly comes down as, as the age uh, increases. So zero to four is the most common age where we see children with leukemia. If you look at lymphoma, it is the other way around. So as they get older, the incidence of lymphoma increases. We're looking at, if you look at brain tumor, I wouldn't say um, we can see any trend, but they can happen at any age, yeah? I would like to emphasize on this. When you talk about eye, we're actually referring to retinoblastoma. So retinoblastoma is 
one of the cancer that has um, that has improved very much over the years in our practice. So if you look at the incident, of course it has to be a very young age, yeah, and most of it, not most of it, about thirty percent of it is genetically uh, linked. So zero to four is the high incident, and then it drops. By ten years old, excuse me, by ten years old, we hardly see any. Yeah. Compare our incident with worldwide. So this is looking at the is looking at the US uh, data. This is the SEER data. So their data shows similar picture. So leukemia, CNS tumor, brain tumors, and lymphoma. So we are not far off from the world from the US data. So if you look at other countries, they have similar incidents as well. So the top is being leukemia. Now moving on to management. So when we talk about management of cancer, I think generally it will be the same. I'm not going to go through in detail, but the principle of management of cancer remains the same. Surgery for solid tumors. Of course, for leukemia, there's no surgery. It's just chemotherapy and probably radiotherapy. But for solid tumors like brain tumors and uh, bone tumors, osteosarcomas, we need to have surgery. Without surgery, we will not be able to cure the child. Then followed by chemotherapy. So chemotherapy, we have the conventional cytotoxic drugs, we have targeted therapy, and we also have immune therapy. And radiotherapy, which we rely heavily upon our adult oncologists to deliver this service, and palliative. So we have our own palliative team to help us out with pain management, care of terminally ill, end of life, psychological and social support, which is very important. Now, I would like to move on to effect of childhood cancer. So when, when the patient is diagnosed with cancer, we will break the news, we will tell them, we will tell the family what is the plan of action, what is the treatment going to be, how long is going to be, uh, when is the surgery, when is the radiotherapy, when is the chemotherapy and all that. But we actually, uh, so we need to realize that the management involves the whole family. Yeah. Our focus is, of course, the patient, but we also have to remember the whole family because the management of a child with cancer is interlinked with the whole family. Because if the family cannot cope with the treatment, the patient will not be able to complete the treatment. It's, it's very different from adult. Yeah, that's why it's, um, it's challenging. So why I say the whole family is affected? Because my patient is, of course, is a kid. Their family is often very young. Yeah, they, they are just starting off. Yeah, most often they'll have two, three siblings who are young as well. And many in Clan Valley, many of them are nucleus family. We don't have the extended family concept. Yeah, so they are all left on their own. One or both parents have to take time off. Yeah, they have to either resign or put in their unpaid leave to take care of this kid. And some of the families have to travel far for the treatment. So we are in the middle of uh, Kampung Baru. So we take patients as far as um, the Merlo, Kuala Pila. Yeah, so they, they travel and they need to come to our center for treatment. So this really taxes the family. And siblings, siblings are often put, I mean, they are not the priority. I'm, it's sad to say, but most of the times they are not the priority. So for the patient, they feel they feel the real effect, yeah? So chemo and radiation will make them, of course, they will make them feel sick, weak, make their hair fall out, 
and this can be very scary for some of them okay and they might think that they are going to die yeah they will ask directly uh, they feel very different from their peers they have to stay very long in the hospital they can't go to school so they feel most of the time depressed So counseling or family therapy or play therapy, music therapy, any of this form of um, therapy really helps the patient. And we also emphasize that we need to include the whole family. We, most of the time we forget about the siblings, but siblings are also important and we need to include them because they do feel they do feel the effect of this child having cancer and coming for treatment in uh, our our center and of course i do need to emphasize financial emotional and social strain on the family so after going through all this we need to see what is the outcome whether it's it's worth going through all this trouble and, and you know, suffer and, and what is the outcome. So I would like to share this slide. This, this is a very, um, it's, it's a very famous slide. All, all uh, oncologists will like to quote these slides. Yeah, so this, this came out in the journal. We are just looking at different time frame. So we look at the time frame from the early, the early um, 80s, from 1960s to year 2005, you can see the outcome. So the graph is actually looking at the survival rate in percentage. Yeah, so this is remarkable, this change. So this is what we are looking at in our center also. So I'm going to share some of our outcome from our different centers so that we could you know, be, be proud of this achievement and tell our patients that we are actually looking at improved outcome. Yeah. So the first slide is, is about leukemia. So since leukemia is our most common uh, childhood cancer, so we are looking at outcome of leukemia and this is done by the Sarawak team. Yeah, this is a very big, big task to undertake. Yeah, so they have 174 patients in their center. So they're looking at uh, two time frame. So the first one is, um, so why I say two time frame? Because we, what we do is um, we start with one protocol. So first we use the earlier one, we use the UK ALL protocol. Some of you might have heard that. Yeah, then we move to BFM. So UKLL protocol is the blue one and the green one, green one is BFM. So later we, we adopted the BFM. So we can see the increase in the overall survival curve. Yeah. And this is the, the second graph is looking at the, the different risk group. So in leukemia itself, we can divide them into standard risk, moderate risk and high risk. So each one has their own uh, outcome. So if you look at standard risk, at this point of time, we are looking at outcome, survival outcome, more than 90%, which is a very good achievement for children with leukemia. Second one is AML. AML is quite a bad disease. Yeah, AML, kids with AML do poorly compared to kids with ALL. So you're looking at different times. So we are looking at improvement also. So in this yellow line, so we are looking at an improved outcome. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, a different time frame and also a different protocol that we use. So we also give treatment for children with Down syndrome and leukemia. Now we have moved away from, from a time where Down syndrome kids were not treated 
yeah, we, we, are, we are proud to say that we have moved away from that and we are now achieving very good outcome. So children with Down syndrome, they can have a lot of other uh, comorbids. So they can have cardiac problem, they can have thyroid problem, they can have... Um, so this, these are our patients with their profiles and we are looking at their outcome. So we look, so all of them had chemotherapy, they completed their chemotherapy and their survival outcome is close to 90%. Yeah? So which is, we are, we are very proud of, to achieve that numbers. So next we're looking at CML, so chronic myeloid leukemia. Many, many of you may, may ask, chronic myeloid leukemia is it's, it's a disease of the uh, adults and usually it's the, uh, the, the older adults, yeah? So children do have CML, rare, but they do have. So if you look at the outcome of children with CML, we see that if we take them to transplant, their outcome is 100%, yeah? If they don't get transplant, then their outcome drops, so about 70 to 60%. But we, we are happy to, you know, to, to quote that if we take them through transplant, we are able to cure them 100%. Yeah, that is a, it's a very good achievement. And, and it's, it's important to tell everyone that, you know, we should, we should try very hard to treat these patients. Now, moving on to the next topic, yeah? battle after treatment. So once we have managed to get their survival rate or survival uh, curve up. So we are now looking at a new set of new set of issues. I will not say problem, but these are things that we need to address. So we know that children's system, children's cells, they are, they are still immature, they are still growing and they haven't differentiated fully. So when we give them chemo and radio, at such an early age, we are not sure what will be the outcome to these organs. So we would like to monitor. So there's a lot of reports that come out that of course, there will be some disturbance in the growth, in the hormonal system, the growth, the hearing, the heart, yeah, cognitive, especially for the children with brain tumors and also some of the leukemias, yeah. There's, there's also a chance of second cancers infertility. So all these issues need to be looked up for, need to be addressed if they happen. Okay, so these are the effects that I mentioned just now. Yeah. So all our children who have undergone the treatment and have survived the cancer, they will be followed up for life. And they will be followed up by us in our clinic. So can you imagine our clinic, it's ever growing. So we cannot, we cannot cut down our clinic because it will just add on, add on, and we'll see them until, until they have their family or until they are working, yeah? So it is a challenge. Now to talk about real challenge. So a challenge in the challenge. So what is the real challenge that we face? Um, something similar to the adults the delay in the diagnosis. Yeah, this is something that I would like to share, especially in the brain tumor part. Because we look at this article, this article came out in, um, in the 80s, 1986. Delay in the diagnosis of pediatric brain, brain tumors. And in 2002, same topic, okay? And recently, 2015, same. Okay, so we are not, I think there's room to, room to improve in this early diagnosis. Yeah, so some of the papers addressed why brain tumors are being missed or diagnosed late. Because we need to be aware what are the symptoms that they present with. The most common one is headache. Headache with vomiting. There must be alarm ringing in our head. Are we missing a brain tumor? Personality changes. OK, 
Okay, and this paper quotes that an average consultation before a child being diagnosed with brain tumor is about 4.6. So this patient's been you know, going around seeing many doctors and then finally got diagnosed as brain tumor. Okay, so what are the red flags? So this, this paper is interesting to share. It's by our local, um, local doctors, yeah? So what are the appropriate indication to, to have uh, imaging? So imaging, CT scan or MRI, yeah? So if you have a headache with any other signs or symptoms, there's a papilledema, drowsiness, confusion, memory impairment, loss of consciousness. Is there any, any other neurological sign on top of a headache? We need to really consider brain tumor as one of the differential diagnoses. Now looking at, uh, in LICAS, when I was working there, so I had opportunity to look at the kids with brain tumor, diagnosed as brain tumor, and look at what are the symptoms they present with. So most common is gait disturbance, then headache, vomiting, and visual disturbance and milestone regression. Yeah, and, and it's, it, the duration of symptom is quite long before they've been diagnosed. And most of the time you look at it, uh, they come in a quite advanced state that we might not be able to start the treatment. Yeah. So the next challenge, so I'm sure some of you have, have already uh, know what I'm getting at. Eh? Treatment refusal. Okay, so this is, uh, this is something that we see all the time. So in 2015, my colleague has decided to look into it and see why exactly, why do they you know, refuse treatment? So we look at all our kids who refuse treatment and their families, of course, in 2015, and um, looked into their, their um, diagnosis and we call them back. Yeah, retrospectively call them back and ask a few questions and then asked why they didn't want treatment and all that. So these are the few patients, these are all the patients that we had on, in 2015 and some of the reasons what they gave for not uh, going, going ahead with the treatment. Yeah, and um, yeah, most of them, some of them opted relapse, uh, some of them opted palliative, yeah, after relapse. Some of them wanted traditional treatment. Yeah, some of them didn't want to talk about it. Yeah, so we just left it as it is. Yeah, so the conclusion that we made during the follow-up is we need to have a non-judgmental attitude when approach families with children with cancer. As I mentioned that when we approach them, we see them as patient and parents, but they are in a, in a situation where they are having more than just this patient. They have other siblings, they have other commitments, they have a lot of things to consider and make their decision based on that. So we, we, we have to be mindful and do not have this judgmental attitude when we, we approach them. Yeah. And also palliative care. We, we, we are very um, early to introduce palliative care in, in the care of cancer patients, especially in pediatrics. So although palliative care doesn't mean end of life care or terminal care, palliative team plays a big role in pain relief, in supporting psychosocially, emotionally. So they have a big role in the management of all cancer patients. So that is in 2015. So looking at recent years, in 2018, we have 16 patients who refused treatment. But some of them refused and then came back and agreed for treatment, which is good, but um, it's going to be tough on our part because, you know, delayed treatment, of course, will negatively impact the outcome, yeah? 
So we do see, so this is an ongoing problem, about 5 to 10% of our patients um, refuse treatment. So having said all that, how are we going to, how are we going to go forward? So taking this opportunity as uh, September as a childhood cancer awareness, uh, I'm just putting all these issues, sharing with all of you to see how you can help. Everyone can have a, a small, a small um, gesture will go a long way. Yeah, so we can support the families, we can support the patient, we can support the hospital, whichever way that suits your own practice and your own um, preference. Okay, so some of the some of the uh, facts or some of the flyers done by the society cancer societies worldwide. Eh? So these are some of the infographics, very simple and. Um, uh, catchy. What are the things that we look out for? How to detect cancer early? Yeah. So this is by SIOP. SIOP is our International Society for Pediatric Chemotherapy Oncology. Yeah. And also, I'm proud to share the National Cancer Society's uh, posters as well. So this year they came up with these three lovely posters for us to display. So we have our own public to, to, to read and be aware. So very simple and very catchy uh, pictures. And also look at the myth and uh, the facts, the, the last poster, it is very, very um, informative. Yeah, be child cancer aware. Notice the small thing. Thank you very much. So just to go through childhood leukemia, since leukemia is the most common cancer, so what are the early signs? So basically they can be fatigued, fatigued because of anemia. Yeah, they can have infection because the immune will be down, uh, bruises because of low platelet, yeah, coughing and breathing difficulties either due to pneumonia or can they have effusion, yeah loss of weight, loss of appetite, they can have skin rashes. Now skin rashes can be due to low platelet or they can be due to cutis leukemia. So they can have leukemia in the skin and manifest as skin rash. They can have bone pain. Yeah, so these are some of the signs of uh, leukemia. So how do, we, how do we diagnose leukemia? I think the first thing you can do in a, in a primary care is do a full blood count. Yeah, and of course the second will be full blood picture, but a full, uh, a full blood count is will will tell you the, the will, will tell you the story, and also examination, examination of the abdomen to look for liver and spleen, and examination of the lymph nodes. If they have any of this, then it's strongly suggestive of leukemia. So we need to rule out leukemia. Uh, some of our posters, now I'm also happy to say that we have gone away from this era. At one point of time, you are getting patients like this. So if you have a patient like this, there's no mystery. You can diagnose this as retinoblastoma, you know, 10 meters away. Yeah, we have gone we have gone past this error. We are looking now at early diagnosis. We are just looking at any change in the color of the pupils. Yeah, so absence of the red reflex, that's what we are looking at. So we are looking at early, early um, detection. So you want to talk about screening, retinoblastoma is one of the diseases that we can screen. Yeah, so just look at the eyes, or take a picture, but don't use the red eye suppression mode and look at the eyes. If both eyes have different color, need to go for further examination to rule out retinoblastoma. So this is, this is a 
this is a piece of advice that everybody needs to know. Yeah. And this is our poster on brain tumors. So what are the things that look out for? Persistent headache, vomiting, gait disturbance, squint, any squint, yeah? Divergent screen, convergent screen, yeah? Change in the visual equity, fits, of course, fits, definitely they'll come to hospital, but the others, other part, you know, they tend to uh, not pick it up early, yeah? Tilt, head tilt, the abnormal head tilt is the fourth nerve palsy. Or if there is, you know, early pubertal changes, early puberty, delay in puberty, all these hormonal changes we need to investigate for brain tumors. Yeah. So lastly, I'm actually coming to my end. So for this month, uh, my team is having a, a virtual run as part of our campaign to increase the awareness of childhood cancer. And we're having this run for two months. So any one of you would like to support, you can go to the Facebook, either you like it or you can join. Yeah. And these are the things. So we, we will post you the t-shirt. And this will be the details of the run, okay? And I think that comes to the end of my talk. So I would like to ask if there's any question, we can go into um, the next session. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, oh, okay. thank you so uh, much, uh, Dr. Kogi. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, do we have questions? Uh, I think uh, we still would be better uh, if we can type. If not, I think we can take one at a time. And then uh, if, um, yeah, I think still better if you can type. It doesn't make it as, as uh, messy. I've got one, doctor. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much. It was such an insightful uh sharing and i think quite a bit of detail uh, that went into that so um I, I wanted to ask you um to to share with us perhaps as uh as a i think one of the things that that is coming out is um, the fact that uh, more and more of us who are in uh, primary and secondary care we we really need to look at a few things including kind of paying more attention to early diagnosis uh, and I, and one of the one of the slides that that you were sharing with us is was about how headaches in children are something that we should be uh, watching out for, doctor. So I, I'm wondering, is there like a timeline or like a like a treatment strategy that you would suggest, uh, kind of uh, in terms of how long do I do I wait? What what can we do? And then what is the point at which you know uh, your headaches seem to be persistent? Let's go and and start getting this worked out. Yeah, so if you look at all the articles, then the most common symptoms of brain tumor seems to be headache. And if you look at headache as a symptom, I'm sure every one of us have experienced headache at, any, at some point of our life. So it's very difficult for us to say all headache we need to investigate. So having that in mind, uh, the suggestion is if the headache is accompanied with another abnormal CNS symptom. So headache and vomiting, headache and abnormal behavior, headache and um, change in gait, change in personality. But then we have to think about, are we missing a brain tumor? Now that we, I also have seen many patients who have migraine now that is a problem because they will be coming in for headache, recurrent headache. So if we have worked, worked up this patient and we are very sure that this is 
uh, this is a patient who's suffering from migraine, then I, I don't see a point why we need to do brain to, uh, you know, CT scan every year. That's not going to help. But if the patient with a diagnosis of migraine has abnormal postures, it means when we examine, we find that why is this patient having uh, upper motor neuron change? Or why is this patient suddenly losing weight? So if there is abnormal findings, then we need to think whether there is something more sinister. So and if, if there's the, like, a, like uh, you were saying, so uh, then um, do, does this patient get, let's say if it's headaches, and then uh, you don't have any other symptom per se. You actually let the like, like treat them symptomatically for a while, and then there's a cutoff, say about two weeks or three weeks, and they keep on coming back with with a history of a headache. Do do then we yes. kind of yes, correct. So if you ask me, what is the cutoff time? Unfortunately, I think it's there is no cutoff time, but I think it's safe to say one or two weeks. Right. Any headache that persists beyond one week, then I'll be worried. Okay, okay, it's good. It's good to know, especially for I think in terms of uh, management, in terms of primary care, because so as you say, sometimes with this very vague, non-specific symptoms, it's easy to kind of dismiss them as being uh, nothing, and then you know. Yes. Yes. Uh, and I think I, I, I'm just wondering whether, whether there are questions, but in, in between, I think Dashini will kind of feed them to us. I was also going to ask you in terms of, because uh, what really stuck, struck me as being a little boring is the fact that uh, about those 4.6 uh, di consultations that you actually need on average to kind of finally pick up uh, uh, a childhood cancer, perhaps. And uh, would that then be, uh, that? that's, ah, okay, well, uh, there's a question and then I'm just going to ask mine first uh, because this kind of is, is being WhatsApp to us as well. Um, so the, is there, uh, what are your thoughts on like, um, it, should there be um, like a kind of annual screening? So as you, uh, what is this? Uh, uh, so as to speak, like for adults similarly or kids uh, at about 11 years old should come in for an annual and then, you know, get looked at. Uh, I mean, do you think such such a thing is feasible? What are your thoughts on this, really? So when we talk about screening for childhood cancer, there's no reliable tool mm -hmm. to to uh, recommend. Uh, of only a few cancers that we can do screening for. Yeah. One is retinoblastoma. Okay. Retinoblastoma needs eye checkup. So we are looking at eye examination. Primary care can do the eye examination. So you just need the ophthalmoscope to examine the retina. Yeah. And we are looking at the incidence of retinoblastoma. If you look at the incidence of retinoblastoma that I shared earlier, the incidence of re retinoblastoma is high in the first five years of life. And then it just drops and beyond 10 years old is almost zero. Okay. So the first five years, if you want to do an eye examination, check everyone's fundus, that will be great. But to say like an adult, you know, come in for a, a pap smear, come in for a blood test to look at the tumor markers, we don't have such a program. Now, whether that program will be one successful, whether it will be cost effective, uh, that needs to be looked into because it's highly debatable. Right. As we look at incidence of childhood cancer, it's actually child, it's, so childhood cancer comes under rare diseases because the incident is not. It is quite high. low as well. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah. That that's true, but no, no but uh, rather than speaking about like a national level screening program or putting in the resources for that or what, uh, I'm thinking uh, I'm to, uh, perhaps considering more in terms of individual practitioners when we actually see these kids take the kind of uh, opportunity to kind of do an opportunistic exam yes. opportunistic examination at least once a year, kind of look at their retinoblastoma for for uh, assessment. Uh, yes, that, 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 might that is. The Yes, that is a very practical approach. So we always advocate 
uh, opportunistic examination. So what will we uh, recommend is examine, look for pelo, look for lymph node in the neck, look for hepatosplenomegaly, look for any lumps and bumps in the body. Because you want to talk about, uh, you want to talk about osteosarcoma. The most common side of osteosarcoma is the uh, femur, tibia, fib tibia. So the knee area. Yeah, so all the elbow area. So you look for any lumps and bumps. Right. Right. So if there's right. any abnormal findings, then just refer them for further workup. Okay. Uh, doctor, there's a couple of questions and uh, I'm just going to start uh, like asking them to you and then uh, we, we can get some answers. So one of the questions is, what can GPs do in terms of screening or advice for follow-up uh, for kids who come back repeatedly? Sometimes lit referrals are literally being thrown out. I understand clinics are crowded, but is there anything else one can do? So this will be very specific to what will be the problem. So yeah. we are thinking of uh, cancer. So I assume that the, the, the general practitioner is thinking this patient might have cancer. Okay. Uh, then the first thing, so depending on what cancer. So we are looking at leukemia. If, we, if the general practitioner can do a food blood count and attach the results, and call the doctors and say, hey, see, I have a patient that I suspect to have cancer and it looks like leukemia and this is the count. So, so if we have someone, a kid with a white cell count of you know, 50 or 60, that is urgent. We need to look at the patient urgently. Right. Yeah, so they can just send the patient to, to the hospitals. So they can come to our hospital. Yeah, or the nearest hospital if they are from so the nearest hospital to that practice. So if they are from Tamarlo, then you just send to Hospital Tamarlo or from, from Klang, send to Klang Hospital. Then right. from Klang, the reference system works that way. So from Klang, they will call us. Because okay. Klang can do further investigation. So most of the time, they, they, they will do further investigation. And then they will call the respective team to take. Now let's say if they find a swelling, and if the GP or some or the general practitioner can do an x-ray and we find the swelling to suggest osteosarcoma, then with that results, need to refer to the nearest hospital. Then from there, they will refer to the other orthopedic surgeon or they refer straight to us, then we will try to coordinate the care. So when, when we get a referral, we try to coordinate because it's going to be confusing to, to navigate the complex uh, system because treatment of children with cancer, there's so many doctors involved. So there are surgeons, there's the oncologists, then uh, and uh, so if it's uh, retinoblastoma, the ophthalmologist will be the important doctors. So there are many doctors involved in the management. Right. And, and uh, Dr. Sorry, just, uh, just to uh, kind of pursue that line of questioning, um, uh, is it correct to perhaps suggest that currently the line is to refer to general pediatrics first? Yes. Okay. General pediatrics to the nearest hospital. Okay. And then uh, in that case, if let's say there is slightly better instrumentation or you know, some kind of better diagnostics, as you were saying, if there's an FBC result with a really high white cell count, does it make sense to then, are they able to actually, uh, really a curious question, to refer directly to Hemonk, perhaps? Um, that will be a problem. It, you know, we would like that patient to go to the nearest hospital. Okay. So if the GP is just next door to Hospital Tengku Aziza, Okay. then just call us. But if okay. they are a bit far, then go to the nearest hospital because most of the time it will not just be a single problem. Most of the time, the HB will be very low, the platelet will be very low. So this patient need to be transfused, need to be stabilized first. Right. So that right. need to be done in, in a hospital setting. Okay. So once the patient is being stabilized, then we take over for diagnostic and definitive management. 
Okay, so just again, continuing on that line, I, uh, what is this? If there's a patient who is like, for example, suspected of osteosarcoma, is it, um, and, and let's say, I'm, I'm just being devil advocate here, uh, like this uh, colleague of ours is saying, let's say you refer to general PT, do you get an appointment very far along or, you know, or, or it's, uh, it's kind of uh, prioritized lower, uh, are they able to then refer to the orthopedician directly or the Pete's auto team? Right. No, that, that should not happen because okay. we usually will take them straight. If that happens, then they should they should call us directly. Okay. Because so far, so far, it's it's a immediate referral. That means they will come in straight. Okay, got it. Got uh, unless it. then the diagnosis is not osteosarcoma. Right. Yeah. Okay. So having think... having said having said that, we also have encountered with occasional patients. You know, they, they call and say that we have a patients with. Uh, so a general practitioner will call. Yeah. So what happens? Let's say this patient is in Clang, mm -hmm. and goes to a GP, and uh, done a, a, an X ray, maybe an X ray or blood counts to suggest cancer. So this patient will be referred to Clang Hospital. If, let's say, they do not give you an early appointment, mm. I would suggest that they go to the emergency straight away. Right. Because I don't think so, they should wait. Right. Yeah. And the other option is I shared the, the services available in Klang right. Valley. So we have right. a few centers that offer the treatment. So right. in the government center is us. Now, out of the government centers, we have two university hospitals that offer the same services. And right. we also have two private hospitals that offer the same services. Same services. So, yeah, so most of the hospitals um, should be aware of the, 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 the referring the system for children right. with cancer. Right. And uh, I think one of the important insights that I think you shared today is the fact that it's better to kind of investigate it a little bit rather than send off a referral with very vague, non-specific uh, yes, symptoms, which, which then uh, might be diverted more easily. I've got, I've got another question, doctor, from another one of our participants who asks, I would like to know, is childhood cancer the effect of blood incompatibility of the parents? Okay, I'm, I'm directly paraphrasing, so... Um, uh, uh, so, yeah. yeah, over to you. Um, so, so, so the answer will be no. When I, when I assume incompatibility is ABO incompatibility. Um, so that will be no. Why childhood cancer or childhood leukemia happens? So until now, we are not sure why it happens. Uh, about 3 to 5% is due to inheritance. Yeah, so inheritance, we have certain uh, cancer predisposing inheritance syndrome, which we are aware of. Uh, other than that, the 95% is, we, we don't know why it happens. We also know that there is random mutation that causes this cancer cells, so that causes this leukemia. So this random mutation, why these cells mutate, we are not sure. So it's not related to lifestyle, it's not related to their food, not related to the handphone, not related to you know the high voltage tension wire and all those things. It is it's not lifestyle and it is not environmental factors. That's why I would like to emphasize again that childhood cancer is not same not as adult disease. cancer. Yes. And uh, right on that, on that line, doctor, I think um, one of the things you mentioned earlier, which was very pertinent as well, was the fact that uh, quite a lot of people, I mean, at least in the front line, need to also take on a more active role in terms of advocating to patients who kind of uh, do not want to take up treatment or, you know, want to drop out of treatment. So um, I was going to ask you, is there like a... Uh, how to say a strategy on how you discuss with these patients 
when they do come to you, when they want to like say drop out of treatment, uh, is there is there like a line or, or SOP or kind of uh, argument thought that, that you use with them if, you, if you're able to share with us? That might be helpful for us as well. Usually how we approach is we, we will tell them the diagnosis, we'll break the bad news first. We will tell them what is the treatment option that is available. What are the things that they need to do? So if they need to travel, then we have to tell them that they need to travel, they need to come here for treatment and this chemo is not available in the nearest hospital. And we tell them the outcome, we tell them the side effect of the chemotherapy, we tell them the side effect of the disease. Yeah, because if, if it's osteosarcoma, then they need to go for either limb salvage surgery or sometimes limb amputation, which is going to be uh, a major decision the family have to make. So having all this in mind, they have to first digest this. Then mm. secondly, after they've done this, what we, so this is the, the, the practice. So we don't have like a SOP or what, but this is a, a practice that we adopt and it, it's been very useful. So after we finish our counseling and our discussion, we will bring, we'll let them uh, meet similar patients and similar family so that they can see what is the what is the um, situation kind of, like yeah, how the progression yes. is like, right yeah so someone maybe someone in the middle of the chemo or someone who has completed so they see one or two families then they can discuss and talk to them so this this support from a fellow patient or family really helps and also from the GPs because some of the GPs are very close to the family. They, right. they have a, a lot of them have this family doctors. They say, my doctor say this, my doctor say that. So if these doctors uh, are aware of this childhood cancer and they also know what is the outcome, they know the treatment. And if they could support and say, yeah, this is the treatment and this is how it's supposed to be. The outcome is, has improved compared to previously and all that. No, they have, they've already have a mental picture of what chemo is going to be. They already have a mental picture of what cancer means. The first thing they'll say, cancer means death. Cancer means suffering after chemo. So, so to change this mental picture, um, one person or as a, as a treating doctor, I alone cannot do this because it's just my word against their perception. So if a few people say the same thing and say, so that's how I got my allies, my, my other families, uh, patients, other patients, families, and they see the patients in the ward, go through the chemo and they talk to the families and they realize that oh, it's not as what they pictured, right. then they will be more open. Right, and and I think that's that's why um, kind of uh, for our colleagues, I think also some of the uh that that i think the seminal slide that you shared in uh, on which you can see all the data of survival plotted against the kind of advancements over the years i think that's a yes. crucial slide to kind of use to make that argument that increasingly this is not something it's becoming more chronic uh disease that you live with rather than a terminal disease that you die with uh yes. you know and and i think that's a, that's an important point to kind of Put forward. I'm still uh, seeing if there's still another couple of questions. We can still take them. I'm so sorry. I think this is my mistake. I'm sorry. I'm away at a, at another site today. I forgot to kind of give you all the first and second code words. So I'm just going to be uh, super uh, efficient and give you both the code words, which is the first code word is leukemia. Spell it however you want, American or British. So it's leukemia. So just just. For those who are signing in for the first time, uh, in order to get your CME points, you actually have to put up onto the form uh, in which the link has already been sent your email. It's also in the link for the video, which we'll leave right at the end when you put it up on, on YouTube. Um, there's always two code words that you have to put in to kind of signify that you attended. The first code word is leukemia, and the second word is osteosarcoma. And, and that's really what we've been discussing uh, quite a bit today, I guess. Um, so, um, uh, doctor, um, per perhaps um, if uh, I, I see that there's not as many uh, more questions, uh, perhaps if we could have some kind of 
words for you to kind of wrap up as, as we wrap up the session for today? My final word will be, I would like to say that childhood cancer is not a bad disease or a terminal disease like you mentioned just now. It's a disease that we are aiming to cure. Now, having said that, we must be realistic. Not all childhood cancer can be cured. Certain cancers till now don't have treatment, but majority of them, three, I would say about three quarters of them could be cured. And I think we should work very hard giving these kids a chance to live their life and, and not prematurely decide for them and, and, and um, you know, and, and um, make them, yeah. Okay, Doctor, I've got two more questions uh, from uh, the public. Are you able to take them? Yeah, sure. From our colleagues. Okay, there's one other question on, why don't doctors release patients who are nearing the end of their lives to spend more time with loved ones? Why put them through more and more treatment? What is the policy or the stand that the hospitals follow currently? That's one question. Okay, so this seems to be a very general question. Yeah, I so I assume it's for all cancers. So depending on what cancer we are looking at. So if we have a cancer that has an 80% survival chance, I think we should treat them and, and ensure they get into remission. But however, if they have a type of cancer that is probably less than 20% of the chance, then we have to discuss with the family, where are we heading? So I also introduced palliative care in one of the arm of treatment of cancer. So this is where the role of palliative care comes in. So palliative care doesn't, doesn't uh, so palliative care have a role in the hospital and outside hospital. So if, the, if this patient is in the hospital, then palliative care will be uh, managing this patient. Because once we say there's no treatment, it doesn't mean that we're going to discharge them home and let them spend their end of life at home. We must understand that there is issues like cancer pain. There's issues like ability to eat and drink. There's issues like bleeding, bowel incontinent, urine incontinent. All these are symptoms that need to be addressed. If we don't address them, it is going to be traumatic. It's going to be traumatic death and it's going to be, it's going to traumatize the whole family because the whole family will remember the event, how this kid died. So we don't want that. So we want the palliative team to offer end of life care so that these, these kids at least be comfortable nearing the end. So um, I think uh, an important point perhaps that uh, Dr. Kogi makes, and I, I think we cannot stress this uh, because it's come up multiple times as well, more and uh, more strongly, is that the fact that really um, uh, the, this, this premise that, oh, doctors, we, we just want to kind of uh, uh, push as much as we can and, you know, uh, just continue treating the patients kind of to keep our jobs. This is really kind of a wrong premise. Uh, to work at. I think one of the things that, that uh, uh, we actually uh, can uh, kind of put forward to everyone that everything is being done based on really an individual level analysis of the patient's conditions, the patient's yeah. survival, the patient's uh, kind of uh, diagnosis, how well is the patient going to do. And again, this is a decision that's being not made by the treating oncologist uh, like Dr. Kogi and all alone, rather it's a team-based decision, one, and second, the family is always in the consultative process. And this is, I think, a very important points to kind of stress as well. Um, so um, uh, I, I, I think there's uh, no other question because another question is there, which I think you may have answered, doctor, uh, but just in case you want to add something is, at what stage do children with cancer uh, get referred to palliative care? You address this a little bit, but yeah, if you so the the concept of palliative care has moved uh, or changed tremendously. At some point, 
uh, it was it, it was so when I was training, uh, I was told that once curative is not possible, then refer to palliative. It is not true anymore. When a patient is diagnosed with cancer, we refer to palliative at the same time. Because why we do that, the role of palliative team in the beginning of the cancer treatment will be for symptom care, that means for pain. So we cannot underestimate the pain that these cancer patients go through. So that need to be addressed. So initially, the palliative team will be looking at symptom care. That means they're looking at the, the, the pain. They'll be looking at the psychosocial, the, the emotional support. And later, once this disease has declared itself as uncurable, so meaning that we are aiming at palliative, fully palliative, then the palliative team will take on a bigger role and will talk about end of life, will talk about terminal care and all that. Then we will be we will be taking a step back and say that, yeah, we will be just looking at symptom management as well. So to answer the question, it will be from the word go. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. So that, that's that. Okay. So um, if there's not uh, other questions, um, I, I'm going to kind of gently draw the session to a close. Uh, and of course, uh, in terms of housekeeping, like I said, I think we, we, I've repeated this and we're just going to do that again as we close the session, which is the first uh, uh, kind of word uh, was um, leukemia. And the second was osteosarcoma. Please feel free to kind of fill up the, the links that are provided to you in the email, uh, as well as in the YouTube, the, the link for you to fill in for the CME points are there. Please go ahead and do that. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps go out and do your bit for uh, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. If uh, nothing, uh, do the least bit, which is kind of sign up for the virtual run and, and kind of support uh, WCH team as they put that together. Uh, Dr. Kogi, perhaps uh, I, I'm going to kind of jump the gun and tell people, oh, sorry, maybe, do you want to tell us what the money goes to for, for that, that you guys collect from the virtual run? Because I think it's a really noble cause as well. Yeah, so we have patients, as I mentioned, that we are covering uh, quite a large uh, geographical region. So we have patients coming in uh, for the first treatment once, when you know, for the diagnosis. So they referred to us, let's say, from Kolapila. So they come to our hospital, we do the diagnostic test and we start the treatment. So they have to go back home and then come back again. So this treatment needs to run. So for leukemia, the treatment is for two years and they need to come in and out of hospital very frequently. Sometimes in a week, they have to come in four, four times in a week. So that is a real burden. Although the treatment is free, but the transport to come in. So that is a, a real, um, you know, many, many family will think twice how they're going to cope with this. So this money we use to give them uh, until they get the support from either our uh, social welfare departments. So, and also we give some really poor patients, we give them some pocket money for them to use. So this is the main bulk of the money used. Right. right. And and so, yes, as, as uh, Dr. Kogi says, really, the proceeds from the virtual run, which they're organizing, actually run towards uh, helping patients out to continue their treatment. Um, so thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. Uh, and of course, thank you very much, Dr. Kogi, first for coming out to NCSM. Uh, to actually do the session today and really for putting together such an informative, uh, interesting uh, set of slides and, and discussing that in length with us. Thank you very much. So um, have a good evening, have a nice weekend and uh, Salamat Hari Malaysia. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone.